Okay, welcome to the 2021 New York State World Languages Professional Learning Series. My name is Candace Black and I am your World Language Associate in the Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages. We would like to welcome you to Understanding Unit Planning with the Revised New York State World Language Standards Part 4 Checkpoint C with Regina O'Neill. The New York State Learning Standards for World Languages compel educators to use a range of diverse texts, including authentic resources. With this in mind and considering the state's focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, this workshop will focus on moving learners from the intermediate mid to the intermediate high level of proficiency by way of maximizing student production in the classroom, using materials that highlight and celebrate the people and cultures of the African diaspora. And special attention is given, but not limited to, how to engage students in the analysis of works of art and poetry created by artists of African descent while using the target language. The workshop will be presented in English with examples provided in Spanish. Let's review a few housekeeping details before we get started. We have over 230 pre-registered attendees today, so we ask that you remain muted and that you reserve use of the chat for questions for the presenter or for when the presenter specifically instructs participants to use this feature. If you accidentally get disconnected, just reconnect or call me and I'll assist you. My cell is on the confirmation email I sent you yesterday. Bill Heller has graciously entered into the chat a number of times the link to the handouts folder for you today. In this folder, you'll find the revised standards, themes and topics, proficiency targets and performance indicators, crosswalks, and a unit planning template catered to the revised standards. The PDF of the presentation that Ms. O'Neill is giving will be added to this folder at the end of the workshop. Within 24 hours of this event, those who attend this workshop in full will receive either a certificate of attendance or a certificate documenting CTLE credit. The type of certificate you will be receiving was indicated in the confirmation email you received after you registered. As noted at the beginning, this workshop is being recorded. The video will be uploaded to the World Languages Professional Learning website within about a week of this event. Those who are unable to attend this live webinar will be able to earn CTLE credit by viewing the video and answering seven out of 10 questions on a post-assessment correctly. Before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to thank the following individuals for their help in assisting with this workshop. Kimberly Harder, Louisa Mota, Barbara Patterson, Eris Thompson, and Yun Xiao Zhang. Our workshop presenter today is Regina O'Neill. Regina has dedicated over 20 years to teaching. She currently teaches all levels of Spanish at the Baltimore Polytechnic Institute and serves as the World Language Department Chair. She is the advisor of two extracurricular clubs on her campus, Los Ingenieros El Club de la Cultura Hispana and the Coao Timuc chapter of the Spanish National Honor Society. Apologies if I butchered that. Through her work on school clubs, Regina has served the Latino community of Baltimore by way of volunteering for various nonprofit organizations like Casa de Maryland and the Esperanza Center. Regina is an active member of several professional organizations, including NAFLA, NECTAFEL, AATSP, and ACTAFEL, and is a regular presenter at conferences. She works closely with her school district and serves as a curriculum writer and professional development facilitator. Regina lives in Baltimore with her husband of 21 years, Marquise, and is the proud mother of seven beautiful children. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to invite Regina to begin this workshop. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction. I definitely want to start off by giving my thanks to Joanne and Candice for inviting me uh, to spend some time with um, amazing New York colleagues. So thank you so much. And um, as mentioned, this is unit planning part or uh, checkpoint C, moving learners from intermediate mid to intermediate high. Just a couple of extra reminders. It never hurts to remind folks to please mute your microphone. We're gonna think alone and write in the chat box. Okay, we're gonna jump right into today's goals. Okay. Um, the whole point of today is to extend our thinking and to identify extra topics of interest uh, that can be included in our unit planning 
and to broaden our class exposure to different cultures by incorporating more resources from Afro descendants. Okay, so just a quick review of uh, the current themes and topics from modern languages, okay? Um, considering these four, identity and social relationships, contemporary life, science, technology, the arts, global awareness and community engagement. There are a list of numerous different topics that we can incorporate and include in each one. And so what I would like to offer you today are a couple of ideas that could definitely suit you in the pursuits of moving your students from one level of proficiency to the next and prepare them for that next level of Spanish. I don't know about you, but this is exactly how I've been feeling lately, okay? So I'm doing my best to put all of my energy into you guys today because this school year has been making me cry, <laughs> you know? So um, it's good that we're here to support each other, to love on one another and to see if we can't get through this together. All right. Okay. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is creating your classroom culture. Okay. Um, in addition to incorporating all of these amazing things into your units, None of this is going to fly if we don't create the, um, um, the best classroom culture um, so that we can administer this, this amazing information, okay? So establishing your expectations with your students, insisting that they utilize as much language as humanly possible, um, giving them and insisting that they use those survival uh, phrases, constantly checking for their understanding and giving them um, daily and weekly rituals. All of this practice is going to yield the results that we're looking for, okay? This is one example of how to get them constantly talking on a regular basis. Um, every At the beginning of every week, you want to make sure that they are articulating something so that everyone is participating and no one is sitting there kind of resting on their laurels. Because as we all know, in order to, um, I apologize, in order to advance to the next level, we're going to have to use as much vocabulary and connectors as humanly possible. That only comes with frequent practice. That only comes with regular rehearsal. I did want to mention um, this activity and I'd like to shout out Claudia Elliott and um, Berta Delgadillo. I got this idea from them. Um, it's uh, the rose, uh, the thorn and uh, the bud. And at the end of every week, everyone runs down the list and gives them the best thing that happened to them this week, maybe the most difficult or challenging thing that happened. And then um, something that they look forward to. Um, when students start off, uh, they usually are very quiet. They're usually very brief in what they're saying, but as their confidence builds and as um, they become accustomed to having to speak, you'll notice throughout the year that the students are going to elaborate and, and really enjoy themselves with this particular activity. Um, making certain that your students have already conquered the sweet 16 verbs is another imperative in order to get them to move from one proficiency level to the next. Um, it's going to be very tough for them if they don't have this already under their belt. Connectors make all of the difference in the world. Um, once you guys have access to this uh, program, um, this presentation, you guys, um, please feel free to go and peruse absolutely everything. So, <clears throat> where we need to make building blocks and steps, scaffolding our connectors so that students feel comfor comfortable and confident in using them in speech and in their writing. And in this way, kids are leveling up, okay? They're moving from writing a, or articulating a decent sentence, adding it, a little bit more with those question words, the who, what, when, where, why, and how, and moving to better sentences. 
and then actually reach an our goal with the excellent sentences. That way they're giving us that rich discourse that we're looking for in the upper levels. This is a review of your standards um, for interpretive communication, for interpersonal communication and for presentational communication. The most important thing that I want everyone to walk away with is the difference between these sub levels, okay? So intermediate one, we're using sentences. Intermediate mid, we're using sentences with a series of connected sentences. And in intermediate high, we're using series of sentences in various time frames. The reason why that's important, okay, is because towards the lower levels, we're presenting the simple tenses, more than likely the present, the preterite, and the imperfect. And then while we're planning our units, okay, we have uh, an opportunity early in the year to review some of the lower tenses like the preterite or imperfect, and then plan accordingly for all the other tenses that we're going to need in order for our students to effectively communicate in those various time frames. So what are we gonna use all of this good stuff for? I am so glad you asked. Well, I wanna talk to you about poetry, okay? Here I have a list of some of my favorite poems to incorporate in my units. And I wanted to share a specific one with you. It's called Chiriboga and it is written by Nancy Morejon, okay? And she is a beautiful lady of Cuban descent. And we do a number of different activities when we're working with poetry. There is a poetry reading and analysis. We do picture impressions of the poem with a, a gallery walk. Of course, we have class-based uh, discussions. And um, there are recitations of the students, okay? Um, the culminating activity being a Socratic forum about um, the themes presented in the poem and what stood out most to the, the children and why. So I did want to give you an opportunity to take a look at this incredible piece um, by Ms. Morejon. And I thank you so much for your patience. Ah, so one example of intentional inclusion was the choice to read and analyze this poem, um, Chiriboga, specifically because it's an ode from a black woman to her own hair. Living in our society, colorism is a serious issue. So I wanted to highlight African phenotypes, specifically rich, dark skin tones, thick, curly, voluminous, beautiful 4C hair, um, all of which have not been the standard of beauty in our society. Uh, the recitation is done from memory after a thorough analysis, and especially the girls are encouraged to recite the poem as if they were Nancy themselves. Afterwards, many of my students say to me, um, Senora, this is honestly the first time I've ever spoken positive, positively about my own natural hair. Um, one of my students actually had braids in her hair and she took her braids out when it was time for her recitation. Um, it is beyond liberating and empowering. It is also very important that everyone come to the realization that there is no singular way to be beautiful. And I noticed that it's an opportunity for my students who do not share this particular um, phenotype to say aloud how they feel about this particular phenotype. It's consistently the first time that black beauty is ever recognized and celebrated. Um, I wanted to tell you about my Socratic forum. I give the students a list of questions. As you can see, what is the purpose of this poem? Why is it important to celebrate African beauty? In what ways can you identify, what ways do the, do the poem identify or demonstrate beauty? 
and all of them are charged with finding a part or a, um, a stanza that stands out to them the most, and then they explain why they chose that particular one. So the rules for my form are quite simple. Everyone speaks twice in order to earn a grade of 60. I usually uh, construct the classroom so that it looks like an amphitheater. There's an inner circle and then there's an outer circle. Everyone has to respect all of the participants. No one interrupts. Everyone speaks in a loud voice. And my job is to mind my business and stay out of their conversation, which is very difficult sometimes. Now, going back to the questions, all of the students have access to these questions prior to the forum. So more than likely, everyone has already prepared responses, okay? Um, this isn't necessarily spontaneous. Where does the spontaneous speech come from? Usually it comes after the students have been talking for about 30 minutes and then they react naturally to what each other is saying. Anything that a student says, that student receives credit for. And so they're encouraged to um, say as much as possible. They're given language frames that they can utilize to help them make their points. And we also rehearse this prior to the forum. So they're accustomed to saying things like, well, I agree with James because the point that he made made me feel this particular way. Or to add what Susan, uh, to add to what Susan just said, uh, I just wanted to make this point. All of our students are well rehearsed with useful phrases and filler words, which um, are gonna come in handy, especially once they make it to that AP level. Um, they want to use as much of this target language as humanly possible. So we omit things like, um, I mean, like, and we fill them with practical things that uh, they could say instead. Uh, what else? Um, all students are also highly encouraged, highly encouraged to not only react to one another, but to be supportive of one another. They're allowed to say, uh, oh my goodness, uh, how do you say this word or how do you say this phrase? And the more they help one another, the higher their score goes, because the whole point is, is for them to interact in a natural conversation using their second language. That is the whole point. And of course, it's going to start off a little uncomfortable, a little messy, but the more it goes, the more natural and spontaneous it inevitably becomes. I also wanted to show you another. I wanted to show you another example that you could use. This is a, um, a sub thing that I teach, I teach beauty and aesthetics <clears throat> for my level three class. And we use Rima Once. Um, it's a famous poem by Gustavo Adolfo Pecker in which he is, um, he describes three different women in the same poem, okay? And before we get into the poem, I wanna know what their idea of beauty is. So we discuss it. What is pretty? What is attractive? What's beautiful to you? Okay. I give them an image, something like Botticelli's um, image that we're looking at right here. And I introduce them to a, an art analysis activity referred to as optic. Okay. And we'll get into that right now. The students always work in groups. And everybody in the group has a role. Everyone has a job. And this is how we maximize all of our students participating rather than um, a few kids in each group who are very quiet or very reluctant and don't want to really participate. Our job is to encourage and include everyone. So the manager, their job is to make sure that everyone is participating 
even the student who's off in the corner with um, very quiet all alone. Their job is to say, so what do you think? Um, you haven't said anything in a while. What is your opinion? Uh, the secretary writes and takes notes on behalf of the group. And then there's a speaker on behalf of the group. And their job is to share the findings of the group with the entire class. And everyone else are referred to are the language police. Their job is to make sure that everyone stays in the target language. So as soon as the conversation starts to veer either off topic or in uh, the second, excuse me, in the first language, their job is to reel them back in politely and sweetly, but reel them back in and keep them in that rich target language, okay? So um, how does optic even work? Students are asked to make a general observation. They will discuss their first impression of the piece. So they sit in their groups and they say, well, I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was terrible. I thought it was kind of weird looking. And they share their ideas. They're um, asked to describe the parts of the piece and they're asked what the title could be. If the title is not known, then based off of what they see, they create one together. They're asked about uh, the interrelations of each piece. How are the parts related in a meaningful way? And afterwards, they're asked to present a conclusion or what, what could the author mean by this piece? Everything is, everything is subjective because the most important thing is expression. I, I really am not concerned about what their opinion is. I'm more concerned with their ability to express themselves. That's the whole point. So <clears throat> after the optic piece, we're still thinking about what beauty is. And so students are invited to look at a number of a number of different images. And on each one, we stop, we talk, and we, we this, the question is simple. Is this beautiful? Why or why not? What do you think? Why do you think that? And it brings us back to how perceptions of beauty are even established specifically in our society, right? And so we ask each other, what is your perception of beauty? Why do you think you have it? And can these per perceptions change? How do they change? I show them a really cool video about body modifications. You guys could check it out a little bit later. So, Ooh, I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon. After that, I show them artwork by Harmonia Rosales. Harmonia Rosales is an amazing painter. She's Afro-Cuban painter. And um, I present my students with her work because my job is to expose them to as much as humanly possible and to just blow their minds with amazing pieces. So this particular piece, is interesting to them. And I asked them, where have you seen anything like this before? Immediately they remember. So we have an opportunity to do this really great comparison of both pieces of art, Botticelli versus Rosales, you know? And this can take up to two class sessions, depending on how you plan it. Because again, the most important thing is that we encourage our students to use those connectors, to use everything that we have already laid out for them to have this rich discourse. It's directly related to your standard four, relating cultural practices and products to perspectives, because this helps us understand how the perspective of beauty is constructed in our society. How is it constructed in other societies according to different artists? These cultural comparisons are gonna come in magnificently handy, especially for those students who are either currently taking AP or they're on their way to taking AP, which is advanced placement language, because they're gonna be asked to perform this on the exam, as a matter of fact. 
So the fact that they have this really great practice is only gonna make them stronger. Just depending on how you construct your units, it's possible that you decide that you want to um, include culture that is specific to a particular country in each and every unit, okay? And it, if that were the case, and let's say you wanted to do Panama in the very first, in the very first unit, you could introduce uh, students to important um, um, information about the place, let them know about the different providences, and of course, the, the, the largest uh, groups of indigenous folk there in Panama, okay? I always show them a, a, an image or, and videos about Comarcas Indígenas de, de Panama. Those are the indigenous groups of Panama so that they can dis distinguish between uh, one and the other. I hope this doesn't, it does, okay. And I give them a music review, okay? So Sek is a uh, singer and a rapper from Panama. And we do a quick bio on him. Um, if anyone is already familiar with his work, the better, that's even more fantastic. But if not, I get the awesome opportunity to introduce my students to this gentleman's work and his craft. And so what do we do? We listen to this song in class and we discuss details about the song. We incorporate um, very high frequency, important words into uh, whatever it is we say, okay? And whatever it is that we write. And so we play the video. The students have a copy of the lyrics with them. Perdón. And we talk about our first impressions. So first and foremost, what do you think of this song? And what catches your, your attention about either the song or this genre of music? And then students are, per, are encouraged to write their own music reviews. Um, you can scaffold it any way that you see fit um, with, the, with the hope that the students um, write independently using everything that you have already given them highlighting the connectors, highlighting those various time frames. Uh, Luis Cordova is an amazing Panamanian artist. He is famous for highlighting women in his art. So you'll always see beautiful Panamanian women. And it's another opportunity, one, for your students to get to know um, a fantastic painting any artist and his work, and you can do another optic should you choose um, with any of his pieces. If you're looking for Panamanian poetry, Melanie Taylor is absolutely one of the best, okay? Uh, she's from Panama City, and she's a poet, she's um, a psychologist, she specializes in music therapy, and she is a magnificent violinist. You can follow her here. These are her um, social media um, hashtags, not hashtags, but connectors, ways to get a hold of her. And the piece I use from her is called Oliaje. And much like you saw with Chiriboga, um, students are encouraged to, um, they'll do a deep dive. We'll look for all of the words that we don't know. We'll highlight all of the words that we do. We'll check the uh, tense of the verbs that she's using. We'll pay attention to all of those literary details of the poem. Then we'll talk about our initial impressions. What do you think? What jumped out of you? Um, um, how many, uh, excuse me, how many stanzas did you notice in the poem? Um, during our Socratic seminar, talk to me about the protagonist. How would you describe the relationship between the woman and the sea? What in the poem recognizes or highlights beauty? Does anything scream beauty to you in this poem? 
And one of my favorite things to do with any sort of poem is visual, visualizing poetry, okay? And so students are encouraged to either draw or they can find images through the internet or they can really go old school and grab a magazine and uh, cut things out. But their job is to show me visual representation of this particular poem. Then we sit down and talk about why they chose those particular images and how they fit together to tell the story of the poem. Okay. So regarding cultural com um, comparisons, one thing that I do quite frequently is uh, a comparison of two great poets. Okay, the first being Victoria Santa Cruz. And she wrote a poem. It's, if it reads and feels like spoken word, if you're familiar with that. It's Me Gritaron Negra, is they're yelling at me and calling me black. That's the name of the poem. And the poem is an amazing expression of how she saw herself as a black woman, how her society, her surrounding, treated her and made her feel about herself. So she goes from there and transitions to transitions to finding, I don't wanna say finding her self-worth, but I do wanna say comes to the realization of her own beauty, of her own womanhood. And the strength exudes through her words, through her own expression, it's undeniable. A lot of my students already have been familiar with Dr. Maya Angelou and her work. So we read Phenomenal Woman. Um, perhaps they are reading it already in their English classes, I'm not sure. But if not, you're just giving them another awesome piece of uh, poetry to read. Phenomenal Woman is a magnificent uh, poem in which Dr. Angelou describes the strength and the divinity of herself as a black woman. And students are encouraged to consider and then express how these two poems reflect black female aesthetics, in what way? What exactly do they have in common? And how can we describe or articulate the differences between the two? And we take time and care for this because one, it's important to our students, you know? And two, not just our black students, but our non-black students too. This is important for them too, because black female aesthetics should be celebrated, period. Absolutely, period. And it's an opportunity for us to recognize more than one idea of beauty. And for students to be able to say, I can recognize that a woman who doesn't look like me or who doesn't look like my mother is also beautiful, also worthy of celebration, the better we are as humans, no? Another uh, cultural comparison, my AP students study Romancero Gitano. Um, there, it's a series of poems by Federico Garcia Lorca. Really magnificent stuff that focuses on um, Romani culture. And what they end up finding out having, after having taken my class is that he was contemporaries and I'll go as far as to say friends, but definitely colleagues of Langston Hughes. They learned that Langston Hughes has, was raised as a bilingual person, as a bilingual human, which is what we are trying to do for our students, right? And they learn about the connection that these two gentlemen had. They learn that um, Hughes wrote for the, the Baltimore Afro newspaper, and he was sent to Spain to comment on um, what was happening over in the Civil War, over in Spain. And not only did they become associates and arguably friends, Hughes asked um, Lorca, would it be all right if I translated Romancero Gitano? And so 
permission was granted, and he published it in the Beloit Poetry Journal in the fall of 1951. Um, the two pieces that I frequently use are Romance de la Luna Luna and Romance Sonambulo. So they're very familiar with it. And I give them Hughes's uh, translation and ask them what they think. After having read this, what is your opinion? Was his approach a little bit different from yours? A lot of my second language learners really end up translating a lot of the stuff that I give them to help them develop their, their second language reading skills, if we're just going to be honest about it, right? So I, I included this because, you know, the expectations and what we're trying to get our students to do throughout creating these units, throughout moving them from intermediate mid to intermediate high is daunting to, stay, to say the least. It's very, very daunting, okay? And our students come to us um, sometimes afraid. They come to us covered in shame and fear and sometimes just natural reluctance. They don't want to. And so when you ask them to do something, they say, miss, I can't do it. I won't do it. I just can't do it. And I, I think of this quote often, okay? Uh, no wonder you cannot do it. You acquiesce to defeat before you even begin. And I have them really, really think about that. The last thing you wanna do is to bow down to fear, bow down to shame and not even try to accomplish your goals. Because until we can do that, we're gonna have a very difficult time moving anywhere. So my job is to inspire them and encourage them every step of the way. They're very, very fond of this particular anime. I don't know if any of you guys are anime enthusiasts out there, but if you are, this is for you. This is Koro Sensai. And he says something that I have always heard um, since I've been teaching. I've heard, you know what the difference is between the novice and the master? It's that the master has failed more times than the novice has even tried. So if you're no good at this, it's okay. Keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, because the only way we are going to realize our language goals, the only way we're going to do any of that is by being committed to rehearsal, committed to repetition, committed in everything that we do. Um, just to touch base back on our themes and topics, these, I, I did include uh, a couple of ideas of artists that you could use to incorporate in, in each particular um, category. So I would definitely use Morejon, um, Angelou and Santa Cruz with identity and social relationships. Um, Julio Cortazar wrote an incredible story <laughs> about um, Cronopios and Famas and it's, it has a lot to do with travel, okay? If you hit me up, I'll be more than happy to share that piece with you. Um, you could also use um, Garcia Lorca and Hughes in the contemporary life. Baracelli and Rosales for um, science, technology, and the arts. Santa Cruz, Sor Juana, and Storni for global awareness and community engagement. I use them specifically in the piece for, um, that I, I, I use for double standards with gender. And we analyze the, the roles of gender and, and how that plays out in our society and how does it make us feel. Uh, we also talk about sexism. And so I use a piece called uh, Hombres Necios Que Acosais by Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, which is a brilliant, absolutely brilliant piece. Please don't hesitate to hit me up if you're interested in anything that I am talking to you about. Um, how are we making this palatable for our students? Well, we're going to have to, one, drill really great vocabulary centered around what we're trying to teach them and have them rehearse that regularly, 
regular rehearsal is what we need, okay? And what you could do is have them pick out five of those vocab words and I need original sentence, but I need you to put it in the particular verb tense that we're working on this unit. You know, if you wanna review some um, earlier verb tenses, have at it just to reinforce that skill, you know? But that rehearsal is, is what's gonna make all of the difference in the world. I did want to show you uh, a little bit of a video and no, he's not speaking English, but if you will indulge me in just one minute or two, I would be grateful, okay? Just a minute or two. This gentleman's name is Stephen Williams and his channel is called American Boy because he's an American boy. I'm just gonna play about 60 seconds of it. Son interesantes las diferencias entre las reacciones de la gente cuando cuando se da cuenta que yo hablo español. Digamos que en esto los hispanos y los estadounidenses son completamente distintos. Por ejemplo, yo recuerdo cuando me mudé a Nueva York y tenía 18 años y por aquel entonces ya hablaba español y todo el mundo en Nueva York pensaba que yo era dominicano. Y lo entendí. Ok. Thank you for the indulgence. So, why do I show this to my students? I teach at a predominantly um, Afro-American school. The majority of my students are of African descent. And I really want them to feel a connection with their curriculum, with what they're learning. I want them to feel a connection with the diaspora. And I also want them to see other Black American people speaking their second language, just like they're about to, just like they can. And so after we look at this video, students are encouraged to consider how do people react when they hear Steven speaking Spanish? Because he gives a couple of responses. Why do you think people react that way? What factors could contribute to that reaction? And then we talk about, and this is also really good for contemporary life, y'all. I just um, thought of that. This can fit in your contemporary life unit. We also talk about what does it mean for them as, as, as um, African-American students learning and developing and grooming their second language. You know what I mean? And all of those conversations are extraordinarily important. Um, we have to remind our students that just as they were born to be doctors, lawyers, um, anything that they could imagine and dream of, they're also born to be bilingual, multilingual as well. This too is their birthright, you know? and it is easier for them when they see themselves reflected in the things that we offer them as their teachers. Son interesantes las diferencias entre las... Sorry. So I wanted to revisit our goals for today, you know, those being identifying topics of interest to be included in unit planning and broadening our class exposure to cultures by incorporating more resources from um, Africana people, um, people of African descent, no? Mm -hmm. And with that said, I encourage you all to please stay in touch with me. This is my contact information. Um, it truly is my pleasure to be here and hang with you all. And should you have any questions, comments, or anything like that, I am at your service. So we want to thank you so much, Regina. And we've been monitoring the chat. There have been quite a few questions. Um, Lori is going to get us started on the questions that were in the chat. And we invite other people who have questions that they haven't yet posted to go ahead and put them through the chat so Regina can respond to them. Great. Thanks, Regina. Thanks for all your good ideas. Lots to think about. Um, one question that came up was a question regarding student speech and student discussion in your classes. And the question was, how do you record who is talking? And then a kind of follow up to that was, do students ever talk over each other? Uh, one, 
of course they talk over each other, especially if it's a Socratic seminar, you kind of, you want it to be as an authentic experience as humanly possible. And so what I do is say, think about how you have this experience in your English class. Do sometimes you lose your manners and you end up talking over each other? Absolutely, and that's okay. I just teach them things like, I beg your pardon. No, 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 you go first. So I teach them pleasantries to help them navigate those particular waters. Sure, they talk over each other, but there is a lot of checks and balances that they handle themselves. They handle themselves. Um, how do I keep track over who talks? I am key, I keep a notebook. Everyone's name is already listed. Every time Joanne opens her mouth, she gets a check. When Laura, oh, that was Laurie, check. Ben, great job. And I keep my mouth shut, but I am watching, I am listening. And wherever the conversation goes, that's where my head and my attention go. And so make sure that you have your, your energy is on 10, your coffee is right there, and that you don't miss anybody. You don't want to miss anybody or anything. So that's how I keep uh, track of everything. Thank you. Bill, Joanne, other questions? Bill's up next. Hi, Regina, thanks a lot. Um, people were really intrigued by how you use the Socratic seminar. Uh, do you use this as like a formative or summative uh, during your unit as part of each unit that you do? Uh, how does it fit into your, your scheme or is it just one of your, you know, um, regular strategies that you pull out? I do use it as a formative assessment, absolutely. However, I'll have one prior to it just to prep them and get them accustomed. I don't want them doing anything for a test that they haven't done before. You know, I want to make sure that they get as much practice as possible. So I might change up the theme, the piece, something will be a little bit different. But yes, I do use it as a, um, a um, an assessment. Great. And um, how, when you um, first like set up the information, give them the input, the 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 poem or the 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 piece of art or whatever, and you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Do you preload the front load vocabulary before you present the text, or absolutely, absolutely. And not only that, we work through the we work through that vocabulary ad nauseum. This is prior to a recitation. This is prior to a Socratic seminar because they cannot argue, they cannot debate, they cannot talk about anything that they don't understand. So we, a lot of attention is given to those particular words and specific words that might be tripping them up or giving them a hard time. I'll probably put a couple of those in the drill the next day to get them more practice on how to use this in a practical situation. How do I use this in an original sentence? Let me try present tense. Let me try future. Let me try subjunctive. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you have, do you use a rubric for the um, Socratic seminar or is it? Uh... I actually don't. Do you wanna know why? Because not everybody speaks at the same level. Uh, in my group, I've got students who speak at arguably intermediate high. And then I have in the same group kids who speak uh, novice, mid novice high. We're barely making any sort of decent coherent sentence. However, if that kid could say, Bill, estoy de acuerdo, estoy de acuerdo, Bill, that's something. That's him being involved, him following something that you're saying. That's him being involved in the conversation. That's growth. What are your class sizes like that you're working, <laughs> working with? Number 35. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. I, well, I, let, me tell you, let me tell you how this works, honestly, because you know, we all have talkers, those kids who cannot be quiet and get, give any other uh, uh, student a chance, right? So let's just say for the sake of argument, Joanne, Laurie, and Bill, you've already exhausted your points. You've already earned your hundred, y'all are good. 
Your job now is to inspire the quiet kids. So out of nowhere, Joanne says, well, Sandra, what do you think? You haven't said anything yet. And then Lori says, Ben, what do you think? I, I was just wondering what Ben thought, you know? So my superstar kids who have already gotten their hundreds, their job is to now encourage, support, love on those quiet kids who desperately need something if they wanna pass this. Uh, I also teach them stuff like animo, 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 any sort of loving phrase to hype and support the kid, you know? And uh, finally, do, um, do you have you ever had to like interrupt the intervene in the Socratic forum to kind of yes. get them back, back or to maybe resolve a misunderstanding that was happening Absolutely. that you saw unfolding? Absolutely. Absolutely. Which I think is dope. You know, the fact that they're having the fact that they're having this discussion in their second language is dope, period. Can't convince me otherwise. But yes, misunderstandings will uh, will arise. And the other side of that coin is some people are just going to honestly, genuinely disagree. So when I intervene, it's Joanne and Lori, they disagree on this. We will respect other people's opinions. We will not attack our classmates ever. We will, I agree to disagree. You are entitled to your opinion. Hmm. You may make a face, but you're going to. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, um, Absolutely, Jeannie. thank you. Joanne? Well, I'm going to selfishly impose one of my questions, which is, you know, is I'm watching all of these incredible artists that you're putting forth I'm thinking, how does she become aware of them? Can you talk about your inspirations? Where do you hear about, find out about these different artists, musical, uh, visual okay. art, poetry, and so on? So Joanne, I love your question. And I'll be honest with you. I was absolutely intentional in my decision to incorporate more Black artists in my unit, period. So I did a lot of research I started Googling. I started um, looking at people's Instagram page, um, following other colleagues that I trust, you know, um, making connections with colleagues from different countries. I happened to come across Melanie Taylor. Um, she's the poet and the violinist. Oh, when I read her poem, I was moved. I immediately reached out to her. Now I'm not gonna lie, I was scared. I reached out to her, dear Miss Taylor, I'm just a Spanish teacher in Baltimore. It would be my honor and pleasure to introduce you and your work to my students. How do you feel? And she hit me back. Oh, I was fangirling so hard, I can't even tell you. She said, let me look at the unit and uh, I'll give you my feedback. She was so, <laughs> she was so cool though. She was so cool. Um, I still keep in touch with her. I do recommend that guys, I do recommend if the, if you are introducing your students to someone who is alive, see if you can't reach out to that person and let them know what you're doing. I think it will make them feel amazing. You know what I mean? Um, as far as music is concerned, I have an enormous and eclectic uh, taste for music. So my, my hands, my heart, my ear is in everything. That's how I learn about it. But I do make sure to follow Black teachers from different countries. Make connections with your colleagues from different ethnicities and backgrounds. See what they're doing. See what they know. Listen, ask questions. And so uh, I do a lot of that. I do tons of that. Well, I've been I love that response. And one of the words that has been repeated over and over in the chat is inspiring, inspirational. And you clearly show how you're inspired and you're inspiring <laughs> others. I'm going to turn it back to Lori. I see there's more questions. Thank you, Joanne. Um, really lots and lots of um, positive responses. Um, as Joanne said, uh, really just inspired. Um, I love this comment, your passion beams. So thank you for that. Um, questions about how you group your students during the Socratic seminar. So how are they put together and organized? OK, um, honestly. I, I group them randomly. There's always going to be super strong kids in each group. 
There's also going to be very quiet, calladito kids in each group. So every group has uh, a variety of proficiencies, if that makes any sense, okay? And the whole point is to encourage the students to support each other, you know? Nothing blows my mind when I, when the first thing I do when I separate them into groups, you guys have five minutes, decide who's doing what role. I will be back. I show up group one, who was the manager here? And when the quiet kid says, I, I am the manager, oh, makes my heart explode. I said, yes, sir, you are the manager. All right, all right, because the manager at the end of uh, this experience has to introduce their, their speaker. For example, hello everyone, I'm Miss O'Neill. I am the manager of group one and this is Joanne, our speaker, Joanne. And then Joanne takes over, but everybody knows manager has to speak. So when the, the quiet kid, the calladito says, yo soy el gerente, wow, that's what does it for me. I love, 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 love that. Um, it's not going to happen right away. So what we're going to do is kind of make eye contact with that kid and say, next time, think about maybe manager. Next time, sweetheart. By the end of quarter two, tell me that you'll be the speaker at least once. By the end of quarter four, come on, babe. Tell me you'll be the speaker at least once because you got this. You can do this, you know? Thank you so much. Um, and then continued questions about how many students you put into small groups. So lots of questions about how to organize all those 35 souls that I you got. Have. Yeah, 30. Um, um, usually there's about seven groups of five. Seven groups of five. Mm -hmm. And for the for the seminar, once once the kids your big chatty chatty talkers have already earned their points. You put them on mute. They're not allowed to say anything unless they're inspiring a quiet kid with no points to talk. Even if you do that, you still might have to have two days. That means the kid who is petrified to say anything in your class, he might need a day and then he'll come back ready to go tomorrow. So you might have to use or dedicate two days just for this experience. That's great, thank you. There was one clarification too on your scoring method. Um, do you said something like they participate two, they get a 60. Then how mm -hmm. do you do increments up beyond that? There was a question. How Good do you question. <laughs> Good yeah. question. It's it's weird. So <laughs> who is 60, right? Three times, 70, four times, 80, five times. You're good. <laughs> You know, because I do have to get 35 kids to talk, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. And the only reason why I made it 60 is to really, um, really inspire them to open their mouths and talk. Everyone has to participate. And that's another thing about me. Um, you know how sometimes your students say, well, I, I'm, I think I'll just take the zero. I never, I can't allow it. I can't allow you to fail yourself, not on my watch, I can't do it. My heart won't let me do it. You're gonna say something. I don't care if it's God bless you. I don't care if it's move over. I don't care if, what time is lunch. Oh, you're gonna say something, honey. And so I give them a number of different things that they can say if they feel completely defeated. Then at the end of the period, you say, give me, give me two more tomorrow. Give me two something different tomorrow. Great. Thank you again. The um, the love continues in the chat room. You've oh. <laughs> you've really you've really inspired us today. We really appreciate oh, it. So glad. Thank you. So we're well, right at the five o'clock hour. Oh, Candy, go ahead. So I want to thank you, Regina, for a wonderful workshop, and thanks to all the staff who helped facilitate this event. Um, uh, before we end our recording, I just want to remind all attendees that you'll get a certificate um, within about 24 hours of the event. You'll also get a badge. So when you get your badge, consider adding it to your email signature or posting it to social media about this event. 
The recording of the workshop and the accompanying post assessments will be made available on our website within about a week from today. And just a reminder that our first five workshops of the 2022 professional learning series have been posted to our website and registration is now open. Please consider bookmarking this website for your future use. Yesterday, we announced the unit plan exemplar development program, which will gather teachers by language from each of our seven regions of the state to develop thematic unit plans for checkpoint A. Selected applicants will receive CTLE credit for all meeting time and a stipend. To be considered, applicants must complete and submit their online applications by no later than December 31st. You can find this information in the newsletter that was sent out. And in the next 60 seconds or so, I will also post it to the chat. Um, I will stick around if you have any individual questions. I wanna thank everyone for attending and have a wonderful week.